Um, Hello and welcome. Here we are today uh, in lecture. I forget the number, but we have a wonderful guest speaker today. Uh, we have Jack Koenig from Sci-Fi, and he's one of the core Chisel developers. Uh, I had the privilege of first meeting Jack when he was a graduate student at the same time I was back at UC Berkeley where Chisel was originally created. And Jack has added so much to the language since then and seen a lot of change, both from it being an original small grad student project to a, you know, industrial project to a industrial project with many users and actually making products, commercial products uh, with it. So it's a great uh, bit of expertise and viewpoint you can kind of bring to us and complement, you know, my academic perspective. So I'm really, really grateful you came here to speak. And so today will be telling us a bit about uh, some of the Chisel internals, as well as I'm keeping a log all quarter of questions you students have been asking that I can't answer. And I'm happy to have Jack here to try and answer some of those, as well as we'll do a code review at the end. So welcome. Please take it away, Jack. All right, um, that did not share my screen. I'm guessing you can see the whole browser, right? Um, I might try this again. No. Okay, that's all right, we'll just do full screen. Okay, oh, hi, is, is that okay? That, that's, you don't see the browser anymore. Okay, great, thank you. So uh, thank you for the introduction, Scott. Um, um, and it's uh, great to be here and I'm happy to give a little bit of some kind of a, a glimpse beneath the surface of what's really going on in Chisel. Um, so um, just to uh, kind of reiterate what Scott said, I originally started working on Chisel as a grad student at UC Berkeley and then um, Sci-5 kind of spun out of the lab that we were both a part of. Um, and then I later joined Sci-5 and have been working on Chisel um, uh, from, from the corporate side. Uh, we at Sci Five use Chisel in basically all of, or not in basically in all of our, uh, you know, core IP products. The things that we really talk about, all of our RISC V work. So, you know, it's a very valuable piece of um, our technology stack. And so, this is kind of a talk originally intended for developers, but I've kind of abridged it a bit in a way that I think will still be useful for users. So I hope that um, you all get something out of this. So, like I said, this is the purpose of this talk is to give you a little more insight into how Chisel works. Um, there's a, there's a you know, decent amount of documentation on the website or examples elsewhere about how things usually work. And so this talk is more about the weird stuff um, about what's really going on. Um, I do assume a moderate knowledge of Chisel and Scala, but we have plenty of time for questions. So if there's something that's not clear, please ask. Um, and then there, this is like I mentioned in a bridge talk um, from a full talk I gave last July and you can find it on YouTube. And there's also a link in the Chisel 3 readme, which I'll show you later. Okay, so if you've ever seen a talk I've given about Chisel, um, you might have seen this slide before, but there's you know, often a question of what is Chisel? And we like to call it a hardware construction language as opposed to a hardware description language. Um, and that distinction hopefully will become clear as we go through this talk. Um, and you know, it's a hardware construction language embedded in Scala. It's important, this is mostly for uh, more industry people usually, um, People in academia don't care about this distinction as much, but it's important to note that it's not high-level synthesis. We're not taking your Scala code and compiling it down to Verilog. Um, rather, we are writing a program, and as that program executes, it constructs your hardware. That's the difference between hardware construction versus hardware description. Um, Chisel is a domain-specific language where the domain is digital design. Um, Notably, Verilog is also a domain-specific language where the domain is digital design, but this does distinguish Chisel from a general purpose language like Java or C++. Um, the way Chisel really works is you've got these constructs, registers, muxes, wires, they're objects in Scala and use a modern programming language to, to you know, kind of assemble them together. And what we like about Scala is that it has parameterized types, object-oriented programming, functional programming, and static typing. Um, these are all features that are common in modern programming languages, but are less common in a language like Verilog. Um, and one thing, the Chisel is kind of similar to a lot of stuff that has existed in industry where people will write Perl or Python scripts and just construct strings and emit them. But we're not that similar in that Chisel has type checking and it's not um, it, is a, it is a language embedded in Scala as opposed to just kind of like, you know, like a macro template library. Um, and that's really important because it gives the designer a different programming model. It kind of helps simplify the way they can think about things. Um, I'm not going to go too deep into that in this talk, but that's something that comes up a lot. 
And most importantly, Chisel is intended as a platform upon which to build higher level abstractions. The goal was for the user to be able to uh, do software engineering and write reusable hardware abstractions. Okay, so that's the what we usually tell people in the talks and in most talks, but now I'm gonna go into what is Chisel really? Like how does it actually work? So it's a library of objects and classes for representing hardware. We have types like UIT, ESET, VEC, bundle, clock, and async reset. We have hardware kind of like operations or binding operations called like reg, wire, IO, MUX, and MEM. And then we have structure, right? You can put your code into modules. You can use when blocks to do um, conditional um, operations. And what really happens when you call these APIs is you're constructing a hardware graph. So I believe um, you just had on Friday a talk about Fertile. So hopefully you know have some background on what like an intermediate representation is. But notably, Chisel itself has its own internal representation that then gets converted to Turtle and Fertile. Um, and so when you call these Chisel functions, you, these are actually mutating global data structures that are keeping track of the graph that you're building. And then we have, as I mentioned, we then emit this graph into uh, Fertile, which we can compile to Verilog. There's also a, a Scala compiler plugin. This is well new in 3.4, so it's been around for like a year and a half at this point, but it is, it used to be Chisel was just a library, just like you could take a math library and create a matrix and call a function and get some you know, calculation back in any programming language. Chisel was just a library that you call. Now it's a little bit more sophisticated than that and that we've injected some code into the Scala compiler, which helps us do some things. It helps us make the API work a little bit better. And Chisel is a lean front end for Fertile. So there's certain compilation that occurs in Fertile on the intermediate representation and not all of that information is available at Chisel time. So this is kind of an important um, you know, picture of what's really going on. Let's see if I can figure out how to do the um, whatever, I'll just have to use my mouse. I can't remember. We, we, we can see the cursor. Oops. Okay. So I'll just use my cursor. It'll go back. Okay. So, you know, you write your code in Scala, right? Um, and that's what your chisel code usually looks like. You then compile that Scala code. So you've probably used SVT or MIL or some, or even an IDE. And that will invoke the Scala compiler to compile the Scala. So that emits Java class files or Java bytecode. And if you've, you know, hopefully some of you are familiar with Java and the way that this works, but once you have that, those, those compiled Java classes, you run, you actually run the program. So the way Java class files, Java bytecode is run is it's run on the JVM. Um, and that's what we call chisel elaboration. So sometimes you may get warnings during compilation, Scala compilation, and sometimes you may get chisel elaboration time um, warnings or errors. And that's this kind of runtime where you're running your Scala code and it's constructing the hardware. The in, at the after the invocation of that, you will get out your elaborated circuit, which is usually a .fir file or a .pb file, which is just a binary representation of the same information. That is then fed to the Fertile compiler, which will take that and lower it down to Verilog. Now, often this Fertile compilation step can be included in the Chisel elaboration step. Um, they, they can be separated. I think often they're combined, but this is like the pipeline of how you go from your chisel code to Verilog. And this is really important. It's really important to understand that you have this Scala compilation and this chisel, a lot like the, the running of the Scala program. That distinction is what, that's what distinguishes chisel as a hardware construction language from a traditional hardware description language. Or this is why we often call chisel generators because what, what distinguishes a generator from just a language is that you have to run the generator. Okay. Um, so this leads to... Uh, if you don't mind, Jack, I might interject to pull up a question mm -hmm. from chat that came in a couple minutes ago. Sure. This is a continuation of a theme from last Friday's lecture where in Friday's lecture, uh, when I told students about the existence of multiple different hardware IR formats, they kind of naturally asked the question, oh, well, is there any kind of commonalities or differences? You know, what's kind of, you know, like the the basis set for them, right? And there are some definitely some common allies. I think today the students are observing, uh, you know, I'll, I'll read a quote out directly. Fertile seems similar to VHDL. I was wondering, or I was curious if there are areas in which Chisel chooses divergent concepts that are, that may be common in many hardware languages is the question. Yeah, that is a great question. Um, 
it, you know, fertile is similar in what it represents to VHDL and to Verilog as well, um, because fundamentally it's trying to represent, uh, you know, digital hardware. Um, but it does, we do diverge in certain areas, um, um, namely, you know, what Chisel and Fertile represent is a subset of what Verilog and VHDL represent. Now, I don't mean that you can't express complex, the same complexity of design. I mean, just go look at Boom um, or some of the, you know, more complicated Chisel designs out there. Um, but VHDL and Verilog can represent things. So I will note my VHDL is a little bit rusty, a little more familiar with Verilog, but um, Verilog at least captures a lot of things that either aren't true hardware, right? Like the way you write a register in Verilog relies on you declaring it and then having an always block and only one always block that's clocked on a clock, right? And that, but that, what would it mean if I had a register in Verilog and I had two different always blocks with two different clocks trying to assign to the same register? The answer is that doesn't correspond to any digital hardware. And so that's that the ability to express things that aren't real or aren't, you know, can't synthesize is not something that you really want uh, if you can avoid it. So in Fertile, you don't represent any of that. Um, you can't express that. Other examples, so that's something that's not useful, but there are examples of useful things that you can express in Verilog and VHDL that you can't express in, in Chisel or Fertile. For example, combinational loops. So this question comes up a lot where people say, you know, I would like to make a phase lock loop of PLL um, which is usually used for, I think, generating a clock. And they'll say, you know, you won't let me express this in Chisel because I'm getting a combination of loop dete detection error and, and I, want, I would like to suppress that error. And our answer is usually, you know, we're not trying to represent that. You should just go write that in Verilog. Like Chisel operates with Verilog. There's no reason you can't have small snippets of Verilog alongside it. And, you know, the, the the question is like, why don't we capture that? And it's because it adds a lot of complexity to everything if you have to handle all of that. And by keeping things simpler, we're able to do to, you know, as a small team and as, you know, trying to keep people productive, we're able to get a lot more work done by restricting the problems that we're trying to solve. Furthermore than that, or beyond that, one of the things that Chisel is really about is about optimizing the common case. The common case in of, of hardware design is digital, like single clock, although you can't have multiple clocks, but single clock um, and using traditional um, physical design flows. Something like a phase lock loop where you have this intentional combinational loop is actually kind of difficult to design and is really, it, it's not just that you can write it in Verilog and you're done. You have to work with your physical design flow to make that work. It requires, you can't just give it to a synthesis tool and say go and it's gonna do a good job. It actually will probably error just like Chisel does unless you give it more information. And so what we're trying to do is simplify the physical design problem as much as possible. So um, we, we allow you to represent as few things as possible that can affect your physical design in that way. This is kind of a subtle thing. It comes up, it makes more sense when you do a lot of ASIC design. It's a little bit less common in FPGAs, but basically some of these restrictions are intentional. Is well, That's kind of a long answer. And uh, I'll uh, move on with the talk and we can revisit if I didn't answer it sufficiently. So, you know, from that previous slide, um, you know, I'm, these are like the different steps in compiling and, and generating Verilog from Chisel. So then I, I kind of mentioned that errors can be caught at multiple times. So, you know, Scala compilation will catch some errors. Those are Scala type errors. This is the best, it's, it's the fastest error detection and we like when errors are caught here. Sometimes errors are caught during Chisel elaboration. This is the runtime of the generator. Sometimes errors will be caught during fertile compilation these tend to be ones that we can't catch in Chisel or in Scala compilation, um, including what I was just alluding to, combinational loop detection. Sometimes you'll see a, a bug or an, an error in Verilog compilation. This doesn't happen very often because we've found most of these bugs, but occasionally it does. And you know, if you run you know, VCS or Verilator or something on your Chisel generated Verilog and get an error, that's, that's usually a bug in Chisel or Fertile itself. And then of course, sometimes you'll find bugs in simulation where of course, if you use an and instead of an or, there's nothing we can do. That's just a, you know, a programming mistake. Um, and I've color coded these to show like what's good and what's bad. We like to catch errors as soon as possible. You know, obviously some errors can't be caught that early and then parallel compilation is a bug if, if 
if we emit bad barrel log, it's a bug. Okay, so now I'm going to walk through a simple elaboration example just because this will help you really understand what's going on, okay? So when you write val wire equals wire, um, so sorry, we have really quickly, we have a question, which is as a chisel user, I rarely go to barrel log. Does that impede finding errors in backend emitters? Um, I would say no, because we don't expect that many bugs in the emitters. <laughs> like they do happen, but um, they're usually caught by people who are, you know, going to Verilog to put their code on an FPGA or to build an ASIC. So I wouldn't worry about it. Um, I think some Chisel users very rarely look at the Verilog and I think that's great. Um, I don't particularly look at it that often unless I have to. Um, ah. And Professor Beamer said, it's the fault of the class that you don't have a physical design flow that needs Verilog. So <laughs> if you had physical design, you would you would definitely have to, to look at the Verilog sometimes or at least use it. Okay, so the simple elaboration example, you write a wire, pass it u in 8.w, and then you connect the wire to foo and bar. So what really goes on here? Um, when you do that wire call, what happens is it there's this, this list of, like I mentioned that there's this global hardware data structure that we're building. And so what happens is we push the wire to that structure um, and it creates a deaf wire node. When it sees that and, it pushes a primitive operation to that data structure, um, which is you know a bit and op, this is a bitwise and with its two arguments, foo and bar. And it actually constructs a named wire well, unnamed with the underscore at the beginning, but it will construct a node here uh, for this primitive op because all of this is done very eagerly. It hasn't gotten like, what happens is in the forward execution of this program, like this is a function call that pushes this wire. Okay, it's assigned to a val. This right here is a function call. We haven't, and this is also a function call and we haven't gotten there yet. So we call this function, which constructs this node. And then we call that function, which creates the connection from this primitive operation to this wire. And so when you look, if you look at the fertile, you're gonna see a wire with this name for this op because that's just the forward execution of how the code works. Um, if you look in, inside the code, you'll see these are called commands. This doesn't matter that much unless you're really digging uh, deep. Okay, so this is an important concept I think for most users um, that uh, comes up more than it should, which is that, um, Chisel has this notion of a binding, which is kind of like Chisel's type system. And this is this is often confusing to new users, but this is uh, just uh, intrinsic for how Chisel works, which is if you have some uint 8.w, right? We call this a type, sometimes a type template, sometimes a type alias, you can call it whatever, but this is an 8-bit uint. If you then pass this object to wire, you get back something that still has the same Scala type of uint, which, is a little bit confusing that these are very different but look similar in the Scala type system. That's just unfortunately how Chisel works and these things are, are the same at Scala time but are different at runtime. And we usually call this a, a value, right? A hardware value, it's a wire. And so as I said, if you were to check their classes, they actually um, are the same in Scala, but in, using the triple equals in Chisel, they are not the same. And if you were to call this, you would get an error saying that you're comparing you know, hardware to non-hardware. So that's just, if you get confused about that, that's what's really going on. It's that we have this kind of like, Chisel has its own type system that is checked during elaboration time. That is runtime of the Scala generator. Um, you know, I'm trying to think of what I should cover because we don't have a ton of time. So I might speed up a little bit so that we can spend more time on questions. Um, if you, Look at the Chisel website. We have documentation there, and all of this stuff is in the Chisel Theory repo in the docs directory. But what's cool about this documentation is that it's actually all checked. So, for example, this is the Markdown representation for the bundle literals description um, or bundle literals doc that you can see on the website. And th this, these little decorators here mean that this Markdown is compiled, and then this part is run to emit this Verilog. So. The Chisel documentation on the website is always checked and up to date, which I think is really neat. Um, and if you want to contribute to it, you can always go edit um, docs on the Chisel uh, repo. Um, 
Chisel stage is something you've all probably seen to invoke chisel. Um, it replaced something that used to be called driver. Um, one weird thing, I don't know why we did it this way, but there's class chisel stage, which is new chisel stage versus object chisel stage, which is when you just do chisel stage without calling new. And um, the main distinction between them is that the class version will often write files to disk. So if you invoke ch new chisel stage .emit verlog, it's gonna write a verlog file. If you do the object one, it just does stuff in memory. It's really not great. We really need to distinguish this better, but that's like, if you see examples using new chisel stage versus just chisel stage dot, that's kind of the difference. It's not very clear. Um, you may notice that there's some, most code is import chisel three dot underscore, but if you look at like rocket chip, you'll see import chisel dot underscore. This is all implemented using this thing called compile options. There's this object that gets pulled into scope when you do these different imports. And that allows us to kind of like tweak the semantics um, I'm going to leave that because you should just be using import chisel three dot underscore and then this doesn't matter. Um, source locators are an interesting thing. I, yeah, I'll, I'll touch on this a little bit. If you do look at the source code for chisel, you'll see that for most function calls, you have like def and, and then this macro, and then you'll see an equivalent def do underscore same function. And then that do underscore adds two arguments. So. What this is doing is if, you know, if we were to just call the function, like if we didn't do this macro, so first of all, all the macro does is it finds all invocations of and and replaces it with do and, that's all it does. Um, but what's important about this is if you, um, if we didn't do it this way, if we just had, you know, this function, the do and be called and, then if you tried to do this operation and then an immediate, immediate bit extract, it would think this argument was being passed as these implicits. And these implicits are how we do source locators and that compile options thing I kind of briefly skipped over. And so if we didn't do this macro, then this five would be interpreted as trying to be a source info argument and say, you passed the wrong type. So what this macro does is it allows you to write your code where you do an immediate bit extract and then it doesn't screw up by thinking you were trying to pass these arguments. So it's really a lot of work just to help you do a bit extract um, in, uh, immediately after calling this function. Um, I don't wanna belabor that too much. How are things named? Um, I might, so this is how it used to be done, which is using Java reflection. Java reflection can only find values that are top level, um, like top level fields of the class. So val.io and val.wire are top level fields of this class but it did not allow you to name things inside a function. So this val reg name would not show up using Java runtime reflection. And, and Scott can tell you, this was a problem in Chisel for like almost all of its existence. And then more recently, we actually um, um, forget about at Chisel name because we've replaced that. We now have a compiler plugin. I mentioned that we now inject ourselves into the compiler because what happens is when compiling your code, we now can insert little hooks to name every val, including X and Y. Um, and it gives a pretty good result in the output these days. Like with this code, you now get, not only do you get the names X and Y, but we can actually prefix them based on the call path. So result calls func. So you get result underscore X, result underscore Y. And this is useful. In this example, it may seem weird that we're doing the prefixing, but if you were to call func multiple times, it makes it to where you can distinguish which X and Y's you're talking about. So it gives, um, once we started doing this, the naming has got, has been so much better since then. Um, and anyway, if you're interested in how this works, it's like inserting these function calls into your code. Um, if you're interested in this, um, I'll just direct you to the longer version of this talk, right? Spend more time on this. Um, you hopefully shouldn't be seeing clone type issues anymore. Uh, this is another long-term issue with Chisel where things would work most of the time and then sometimes it'd be like, could not figure out clone type. And you're like, what does this mean? <laughs> um, and the basic gist in is that, you know, you know, if I have this val gen of some bundle and this is a anonymous bundle, I noticed that you have a question about that that I'll get to here in a minute, but you know, this val gen is just an object and I'm passing the same object to two different binding ops, right? This IO construction and this wire construction, right? Which means this, this IO and this W need to be different objects. 
in order to make them different objects, I have to be able to create fresh instances of this one. And so I have to be able to, we call it clone type it. So we need the ability to create copies of any data, including user-defined types like this bundle. And so the way this works, the way this used to work is you would, in older chisel code, you might see a lot of override def clone type where people would have to implement it themselves. And this is just boilerplate. It's just formulaic boilerplate. Um, so nowadays um, we have the compiler plugin, which does naming also can insert uh, clone type implementations. It works really well. It's a lot faster. Um, oops, I accidentally deleted too much here. Uh, this is supposed to me say always on in Chisel 3.5. Um, so if you go back to Chisel 3.4, it, it was introduced in 3.4.3 is opt-in, but as long as you're using Chisel 3.5, you're always using this and it works a lot better than how things used to work. Um, and if you're curious, it's generating these methods, um, just implementation details for how it works. And with that, I think we'll move to questions. Sorry, I kind of sped up there, but you know, I don't want to spend all of our time on that, on the internals. So I thought I would um, would move to the questions here. So um, Professor Beamer sent me these questions um, and I will, um, I'll answer them. I'm looking at them. I think I'm going to switch the order slightly though, because I think question one and two seem related and I'm going to start with question two. Um, so why is iterate used to implement shift register in the standard library? Uh, couldn't a more conventional recursive function or even for loop suffice um, with the belief being it's a macro. So it's actually not a macro. Iterate is um, just a function. And we can look at this by, let me end the full screen. And I'm going to pull up the Scala API docs to explain this because I find that the best way to explain this. So if you look at the Scala standard library and all of this is on scalalang.org, I, I have this bookmarked. I look at this all the time. I recommend people look at the API docs. And if we search, I think we said seek.iterate. Sorry, this Zoom thing is blocking me. Okay. Um, it's just iterate, but I believe it's seek.iterate. So if we go look at seek, so first of all, when you click seek in the API docs, you'll notice this is pointing to T, which is the trait, um, trait seek. And that's like an instance of a seek. Like a list is an instance of a seek. A vec, a chisel vec is an instance of a seek. And a seek is like a super type. It also has a companion object. You can get that by clicking at the top. And this is, you can think about companion objects as kind of like factories for constructing the associated class. So, you know, when I construct, I can do like seek.empty to make an empty seek or seek.apply, which we know is just parentheses, like seek open parentheses one comma two comma three is calling seek.apply and that will construct the seek. So in the implementation of shift register, we use dot iterate. And that's actually just this function call. And it really actually is, um, I believe, yeah, okay. So you can actually think about like you, you could implement iterate very easily using a recursive function call or even a for loop if you want. So basically the answer is iterate is just a, uh, a clever method to help you do something um, where you start with an element and then you keep calling the function on that element. So if we go look at the source code for shift register, Um, okay, I should have looked at where it was before just winging it here. I know it's in utils. Yeah, I think it's in util reg. That would make sense. Okay. So, um, sorry, this is a little bit small for me. So I'm actually going to stop sharing really fast and then start sharing again on my larger screen. Okay, hopefully this is big enough to read. Maybe I should make the text a little bit bigger. Um, but the way this is implemented is using iterate, taking this input data, right? Saying we're gonna do some n plus one of these and 
this, the way this works, if we go back and look here, what it says is that um, it's repeated applications of a function to a start value. So the second argument list is a function that we're applying to first the start, then to the result of that again, and then again and again and again. So effectively, it passes this in argument and creates a reg enable. And that this underscore here is, you know, the, the first time for the zeroth invocation of iterate, or like the first time it iterates, it passes this in. Then it takes the result of this reg enable and passes it as the argument, it passes that as the argument, it passes that as the argument. So you can see it's constructing a chain of reg enables, um, kind of like unfolding it. Another good trick that I use for this sort of thing, if I don't understand how a function works, um, and this I used to do a lot more um, when I was newer to Scala. So let's just have a fresh Scacy. I don't know if y'all use Scacy, but it's great for like little code examples. Um, let me just switch back to Scala 2 because it defaults to Scala 3. So let's say I don't know what seek.iterate does. Um, Right, and I might like you know call it seek dot iterate pass zero as my first argument. Let's pass a as my first argument. We're gonna do it eight times, four times, and we're going to just um, you know do a little concatenation. So a plus or the argument passed plus I don't know a period. So this is a function that takes a string and concatenates a period to the end of it, and then we can just see what that gives us. Um, if it will go. <laughs> so we can see, you know, as I said, it keeps calling this function on the arguments and notice that it does start with a start argument. So there's one where it hasn't called the function at all. And that would be why um, we drop, this drop one means like drop the first element. Um, okay, so Back to question one then. So this, this actually isn't a macro, but what benefits do macros provide? Um, macros are very useful for people writing advanced Scala libraries. So macros are useful for me making chisel. I don't think they're usually useful for chisel users. What a macro lets you do, if you think about macros, you know, if you're familiar with macros in C, for example, a macro in C is like this string thing that like does a bunch of string expansion <laughs> before your code is compiled. Scala macros are sort of like that, but a lot more powerful. Instead of just string expansions, they're actually like the Scala AST. And so you can write Scala code to edit the Scala code that you receive. This, like it, your macro is code that executes as part of the compiler to change the AST it's been given. I don't think users basically ever need it. So I would recommend not writing macros. <laughs> it's very much for like Chisel uses them sometimes, but generally they should be avoided just because they're, you know, a very powerful tool. Okay, how does the implementation of an anonymous bundle work? When creating a subclass of bundle, it's clear how things fit in, but anonymous bundle just takes code with embraces. Yeah, that's a fair question. Um, so let's see if I can get back the chisel. Oops. So here I have a, uh, a little chisel template that I use a lot. And, you know, this is useful because I can just, you know, let's add a bundle. I O input new All right, and let's do just have two of these just for fun. This one an output, right? And now I can connect through to bar. Okay. So this question is like, what does this mean, right? Because you could also have written this as class my bundle my bundle extends bundle ballet equals you and eight, right? And the answer for what's going on here is this is this is a Scala construct called an anonymous subclass. So if you're if you're wanting to Google this to read about it, it's that's the like term you're looking for, anonymous subclass. And so effectively, what this does is when you write this new type open curly brace, you're creating a new subtype of this that doesn't have a name. That's why we call it anonymous and is just adding this field. Um, that's like the only difference between it and the thing. So I could 
what, what this actually tends to look like, what this code would really like, what really happens like in the Java bytecode is you see something like, they give it some weird name, like example, dollar sign anon, dollar sign one, extends bundle val a equals u and a. So effectively, this is the same as having this and then writing, you know, new example anon. I'll just do it this way to kind of illustrate the point. Um, why is this useful? I mean, one of the things that's useful about anonymous subclasses, if you know you're never gonna wanna create another instance of that class, you don't have to bother creating a name for it. Okay, it doesn't like, it may not like my use of underscore of uh, dollar signs, but I can make it take it. Um, a trick in Scala is if you need to use characters that aren't legal identifiers, still not working, interesting. Oh, I forgot to write new. <laughs> so, even I get bitten by this sometimes. If you ever are wondering why something's not working and it's saying not found value, no value means it thinks you're referring to a class, sorry, to an object, not a class. So when I just wrote example a non dollar sign one, it was looking for this, but there is no object. So it got confused because I meant to write new. So I shouldn't need these back ticks, but I'm gonna leave them. What these back ticks do, in Scala as well, I don't recommend using this because it will often lead to confusion, especially if you're writing chisel where you're compiling to Verilog anyway. But if you, for some reason, need to use a reserved keyword as a name or you need a character that doesn't exist like, or isn't allowed as a normal identifier, then you can use back ticks and then that will let you make whatever identifier you want. Like you can put arbitrary Unicode in here. I don't recommend doing it though. Okay, so anyway, anonymous bundles, they are just useful if you know you're never gonna need to refer to the type again. If you are, you should, and in general, honestly, naming your bundles is better. I think it makes more clear code. Um, it's just an old uh, style thing that people used to do. And some people still, you know, continue to do. Okay, um, for defining a type alias is the best way to declare a definite object. Um, yeah, I think this is, a, is right. I, this is how I would do it. Um, you could make, no, you, I think, yeah, you generally need to make it a def. You could make it a val in some cases, but I would say make it a def. It will cause you fewer problems. And then, yeah, now we can refer to this as just companion.myt, right? And you probably know this, but just make sure you can also import, if you want, from objects, you can import companion.myt as well. And then you can just use it like my T. I, anyway, the answer is yes, that's how to do it. Um, for creating a bundle, we have been wrapping it in a wire and assigning fields individually. Can the bundle literal syntax clean this up and perhaps remove the need for a wire wrap? Um, the answer is yes, it should. Um, we kind of have an open task among the developers to create kind of a wire init, just like there's a VEC init um, where you can have a VEC um, that's a good example of this. Val. Here's another, generally I don't recommend writing code this way, but if you ever see Scala code like this, this means this is very, <laughs> this is very different than this. Okay. So did I turn on insert? I feel like in case the insert just turns on randomly and I don't know why. Um, this means that I'm expecting a tuple here and I'm unapplying it into two sides, like the first and the second. That's not what I'm saying. This means take this and replicate it for each of these vowels. So this right here is equivalent to writing val bar equals the same thing. So sometimes a nice shorthand if you need to create two inputs that are identical. Uh, I mainly use it for examples. I don't usually use it for uh, when I write code that I want to maintain and have other people use. So VEC init allows you to do stuff like this. This is, I think, what you're getting at because you can't do this as easily with um, bundles, right? There's no way to group. If I had a, if, if out were a bundle, I have no way to kind of like create a bundle with these two fields in it. I have to, as you said in the question, create a bundle and then assign the fields individually. So 
The answer is there should be a way to do it. It, it will be similar to bundle literal. Like instead of new my bundle dot lit, it'll probably be new my bundle dot init, but it will do the same thing. So the answer is sorry, that is needed. Um, I had an intern working on it last summer, but summer ended and it hasn't gotten done. So, um, and then finally, uh, advice for working on with read ports on sync read mem, the code examples assign wire attached to the report don't care. Um, is it better conceptually pragmatically to use an explicit read port or an implicit one? Sometimes it's confusing on when it gets updated. So I would say it's better to use an explicit read port. Um, so let me see if I can find one of these examples. I'm gonna pull up, I think I have this is a website here. So hopefully you know about this website, chiseling.org. Um, you can see all the documentation by clicking here or clicking here. And then there should be a docs page on memories. Um, so I'm guessing this is what you're talking about because here we have, a, well, this is on a read write port, um, which maybe is a little different. So let's maybe look at this one. Okay, and you know, what's really cool about SCASTY is I can just copy paste this in here. Don't import twice. And this will compile and run. And so the issue that you're talking about here is that this don't care is a little bit confusing, especially because yeah, this is a sync read mem, which means that the data shows up a cycle after you initiate the read. Um, and so this is a bit confusing. Oh, wait, no, that's IO data out. Sorry, not mem data out. Is this is this the right example, Scott, for that question? Do you know? Uh, it was from that page. I'm not sure which. I think it was one of the higher ones higher up that was simpler before we got to mass and um, read write. To go a little higher, I think there was still. Or maybe this single ported. Yeah, the well. single ported one was what we're looking at. Okay, yeah. Yeah, the mask definitely complicates it unnecessarily. I didn't want to deal with single ported either. Okay, so I see. It is, I can see how this is a little bit not clear because, you know, you initiate the read. Um, yeah, this is a little bit, this is a little bit weird. So, so I, to clarify, I think the confusion was, uh, you can imagine, you know, if you have this implicit port where you use when, and you say when, you know, do a read or something, um, it's natural to use that mem iota address thing, like in the expression to do math on, like, oh, I'm gonna do math or compare it. But like, it's the, the when statement is not really the place where it's available, right? It's more like the place where you're triggering that. And so I think, I'm just trying to think what's the best practice for me as an instructor. Maybe I could recommend students always use explicit port and that way they can kind of make it clear to using the comparison at the right time. Let's, let's say if you really want to read from memory and then compare based on the value, right? And so mm -hmm. if you put the comparison inside that when block, I think some students get, surprising results. Um, and yes. so. Oops, that's not what I meant to blow up. I agree with that statement. Um, so pulling up the Chisel API docs, uh, you know, if you look at like sync read mem. We see the dragon to the bottom. <laughs> yeah, don't look at, don't look down here. <laughs> the, although I, I told you what these, these do means. So now you know that these are just macro expansion stuff. It's not that scary, but I do think it's better to use, if you want to read with an enable, it's probably better to just call the read with an enable function. I think you're going to be happier doing that. So I, you know, I would argue we should be, some people are talking about this a lot. Um, read address. And then the enable here would be io.enable and not io.write. Because we have here, if it's a write, do a write, otherwise do a read. So I would probably recommend writing code this way. I think it's more clear. Some people like this kind of style, but I think it's generally falling out of favor. Um, people tend to like more explicit, sorry, this is mem.read. People tend to like more explicit uh, ports. So. The answer to your question is uh, maybe just avoid the problem by using explicit ports. Um, yeah, sorry about the confusion. This is like very old style that we've had to maintain. I don't know that I would uh, write the API this way. 
I, I think people have found it very natural for regular mems. I think this the synchronous read really kind of throws them off because like I said, it's so natural and you just kind of when blocks to have, you know, do you use that result to read right away? Like I said, it's not really available right away. So it's kind of a little tricky with how that looks. Yeah. Okay. Well, great. Uh, thank you. Um, yeah. Maybe I'll open it up for any questions from the students before we shift gears to the mini code reviews. Okay, well, maybe there's no questions. I'll stop the recording. We'll stay on the line. Let's do the little mini code snippets.